guys got packages at Christmas. You know what was in mine? Stuffed dates. Stuffed dates in Africa under the date bonds. Can you beat that? One good thing about Christmas, you may get homesick, and we did, but you also get Christmas dinner. take notice of the kids. First off, they were kind of shy. But Arab kids are no different from the kids back home when it comes to candy. A lot of them looked about half starved. The Germans had picked the land clean. So we gave half our milk ration to the Red Cross. And they ladled it out. Off-duty, we just roamed around, looked. And we saw some mighty strange sights. the Moorish girls looked like behind the veils. Wondering was about as far as we got. One Sunday, the middle of January, we were hanging around, catching up in the news from home, when we were rooted out for assembly. They told us to polish our brass and shine our leather. Some of us said, what's the big idea? Well, we found out. And you could have knocked me over with a tank. It was the Prez himself, riding along in a Jeep. When we saw Mr. Churchill come in, not puffing his cigar, we knew something big was cooking. In a small seaside hotel at Casablanca, discussions began at once. Their purpose, to design the shape of victory in Africa and beyond. First, a meeting was arranged between Generals de Gaulle and Giraud, who had succeeded Admiral Dalla, assassinated a month earlier. Out of the meeting was to grow the union of the fighting French, who had never lost hope, and the French for whom hope had been reborn. Second, the united command for the new Tunisian campaign was created. The Allied troops in the area were now predominantly British, but by common agreement, General Eisenhower continued in supreme command. As his deputy commanders, three British officers, General Alexander on land, Admiral Cunningham on sea, Air Chief Marshal Tedder in the air. Under them, British, American and French officers and men serving side by side. The whole scheme, a dovetailing of command, unique in military campaigns. Third, we fixed the terms which would end the fighting. Unconditional surrender. 
Of all these decisions, our Russian and Chinese allies were kept fully informed. The conference ended, Mr. Churchill flew on to Tripoli to greet the victorious Eighth Army and explain its vital part in forthcoming events. For the decisive hour was at hand. Battle lines were drawn. In the north stood the British First Army. In the center, General Giraud's French troops. In the south, the Americans. Further south, a small group of fighting French had completed its historic 1,500 mile march and taken up positions on the left flank of the British Eighth Army, which faced the formidable Marath Line, behind which barrier Rommel's army, after its long retreat, had entrenched itself. Tunisia was gray with German troops, 15 full divisions. No scratch troops, these, but battle-wise veterans of Poland, France, the Balkans. They, together with seven Italian divisions, were armed with the most modern types of equipment, including the newest fighters and bombers of the German Luftwaffe. The German orders were, hold Tunisia at all costs, keep control of the Mediterranean. Rommel, standing behind his Marath line, saw that he must soon be faced with an attack in the rear from the Allied armies along the Great Dorsal, as well as an assault by the 8th Army at Marath. He therefore struck first, in an endeavor to remove the menace behind him. On February the 14th, the blow was struck. Heavy armored columns burst out of Fayyid Pass in the mountain barrier and threw into the valley beyond. In the face of their onslaught, Allied armor withdrew with heavy losses. By the 21st, the enemy had forced his way through the Kasserine Pass, and his armored columns were advancing in a three-pronged thrust. One main column aimed at Tabassa, our supply base in southern Tunisia, and another at Thala, key town in our lines of communication. Almost within sight of his objective, he was halted. American, British, and French forces all stood immovable against the final impact, and in counterattack, broke it, while Allied air power pounded Rommel's lines of communication and supply. The threat was ended. Advancing past destroyed German armor, we reoccupied Kasserine Pass, and by March the 17th, the original battle lines had been restored. As soon as Rommel saw that his westward thrust was doomed, he made an abortive attack south against the 8th Army. The Germans unveiled the new Tiger tank, the British the new 17-pounder anti-tank gun. Fifty-two Tiger tanks were left burning hulks. From then on, the initiative was ours. Of the various strategies which might now be employed against the enemy, General Eisenhower chose one which envisaged the entire military situation in terms of a cylinder. The Western Wall, Allied land forces along the Great Dorsal. The Northern and Eastern, Allied air and sea power concentrated in the Mediterranean. The seaports of Tunis and Bizerte were to act as the intake valve through which those enemy troops that escaped the devastating attacks of planes and submarines based at Malta were to be sucked into the cylinder. At the bottom of the cylinder stood the powerful British Eighth Army to serve as the piston, which in its upward stroke would push the enemy into an ever smaller space. Still in possession of the enemy were certain high hills to the west of Tunis and Bazaar. Their capture was an essential part of the entire strategy, for these hills were the spark plug, which, when the piston had forced the enemy into a state of high compression, would explode the combustible mass. That was the final strategy. To succeed, perfect coordination would be necessary between land, sea, and air forces. The Northwest African Air Force, commanded by General Spots, was divided into five major groups, of which three were combat. The Strategic Air Force, under General Jimmy Doolittle. These were the big boys, the long-range bombers, pounding away at enemy bases and shipping. 